like we have. Yes, that's me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah in all her glory. <laughs> okay, it's recording, so. Okay, we are recording now, so. Uh, just move this over so I can get the slideshow going. And this worked good last week, so, you know, hallelujah, praise God. The recording came out good and everything, and you could see me up in the corner there, so let me just get move this over. Okay, there we go. Move this up here. Okay. All right, so we're starting in Joel or Yoel chapter 1. And uh, the theme of this is the locust invasion. And I've got a lot to share as I was studying it and everything, what the scriptures have to say. Uh, so let's go to this. Let's just go into prayer. Elvino Mokano, our Father, King Father, we thank you for this Shabbat. We thank you as we continue to study the, book, the 12 books of the scroll, Father, the prophets, and we thank you, Father, that you're continuing to reveal things to us that we need to be aware of, just not in the past, but also how it affects the present and our future, Father, as we serve you, Father, and that our eyes are open and that we know the signs of the times, Father, and we are aware of what is happening so we can intercede properly and be prepared for uh, your return and what you have called us to do in Yeshua's name, amen. So I'm going to read all of uh, Yoel chapter 1 because I'm just going to be highlighting certain sections, but we want to read the whole chapter um, just so we have an, an, a context of what is going on. The word of the Lord that came to Yoel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Awake drunkards and weep and wail all of you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste, and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white, wail like a virgin girded with sackcloth. For the bridegroom of her youth, the grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of Yahweh, and the priests mourn, the ministers of Yahweh. The field is ruined, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined, and the new wines dry up. Fresh oil fails. Be ashamed, O farmers, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vines dry up, and the fig tree fails. The pomegranate, the palm also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, rejoicing dries up from the sons of men. Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my Elohim. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your Elohim. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of Yahweh, your Elohim and cry out to Yahweh. Alas for the day, for the day of Yahweh is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty, and he has no food been cut off before our eyes. Gladness and joy from the house of God. The seeds shrivel under their clods, the storehouses are desolate, the barns are torn down, for the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle wander aimlessly because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Yahweh, I cry, for fire, has devoured the, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame has burned up all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, for the water brooks are dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So again, here in um, 
versus uh, beginning with two to four. Um, we just we just read that, but I'm going to read it again. This is actually from the Tree of Life version. Hear this, elders, give hear and all inhabitants of the land. Has this ever happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it and your children to their children and their children to another generation. What the locust left, the swarming locust has eaten, and what the swarming locust has left, the canker worm has eaten, and what the canker worm left, the caterpillar has eaten. Trey Hassar, um, I'm just using one quote from Trey Hassar um, because the, uh, I'm also using the Jewish study Bible and the um, Yes, the version because they've got they had some good commentary on this. It really was the same, almost close to Treasar. So starting here until the end of chapter two, the prophet foretells of a great plague of Israel and destroys all vegetation, causing a devastating famine throughout the land. This was decreed by the Almighty in retribution for the sins of the Jewish nation. And the prophet urges the people to repent from their evil ways and thereby bring about the annulment of the decree. He begins his prophecy by emphasizing the unique scale of the impending plague. This is a, a commentary from the Jewish Study Bible regarding the plague of locusts. Um, again, it says, a communal cry or lamentation to the Lord. Verse 4, it refers to the cutter, the locust, the grub, and the hopper. There are many references to locusts in ancient Near East texts. Some of these references associate the imagery of swarms of locusts with that of a large invading army or troops. The use of these four terms may represent an attempt to convey a sense of completeness rather than express a biological detailed focus. Abravanel understands the text as metaphorical. The four kinds of locusts refer to four nations that will rule over Israel, Babylonia, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now again, in prophecy, prophecy could be twofold. Um, there was a literal locust invasion, but it also, things that happen in the natural can also refer to other things in the natural as well. So I believe both apply. You know, in the Greek mindset, it's either or. But in the Hebraic concept, yeah, it could be this and it could be this. And you see this with prophecy all the time. That again, that's why we're studying it, because yes, it applied to this time, but it also, some prophet from uh, the prophecies also point to the future and the time we are living in. Let future generations know what a terrible locust plague this was indeed. This is exactly what Joel did when he wrote about it in his book. Tell your children. So again, we are commanded, and we're going to look up these scriptures in the Torah and also in you know, other places of the Tanakh, that we are to pass this down to what happened to our children and to our children's children. Uh, again, even today, we are responsible to sow the word into our children's lives. And if we have grandchildren and they have the opportunity to do that, praise God, I'm still believing that one day we'll be grandparents, hallelujah, to pass it on to our grandchildren. Because I believe, and I know that because my, the influence my grandmother had in, in my life, that grandparents have a great influence over their grandchildren. It's a different type of relationship. Um, where a lot of times they'll, you know, again, they'll, we can influence them, even if the parents aren't living for the Lord, we can influence them to serve God. Again, my grandmother did because that was the situation. So let's go to Exodus 13.8. Again, this is a command. You shall tell your son on that day, saying, it's because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt. So again, they were to share, continually share from generation to generation the deliverance of Yahweh. Go to Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and that they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life and make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Hallelujah. Number one, we are to be diligent to keep the word in our heart and keep it before our eyes and also pass it on to the next generation. 
go to uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And then verses 20 to 21. And when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean which Yahweh or your Elohim commanded you? Then you will say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and Yahweh brought us up from Egypt with a mighty hand. And then go to Psalm 78, 4 to 6, or to Helene. Seventy-eight, four to six. We will not conceal them from our children. Well, let's go up. Let's begin verse one. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of Yahweh and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he has established a testimony in Yaakov and appointed a Torah in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that we should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. I believe in my heart that there's going to come a day with the things coming on the earth, that our children are going to come to us and our family with questions. And we need to be prepared to answer those questions and show them in scriptures why these things are happening. Hallelujah. Joel described again the devastation as he told about four ways of locust invasion. That which the palmer worm has left the locust. Eating. So each invasion, there's actually four different ev ev invasions by four different types of locusts. Okay, the first, the first wave didn't totally demolish everything that was left for the second wave and then the third wave and then the fourth wave so there's actually four different locusts who came upon the land and brought destruction so let's look at agents how you know Yahweh will use different things to bring judgment to his people let's go to Jeremiah 15 2 to 3 Actually, you know what? I'm going to skip over because I put a chart together based on this. I'm just going to show this chart here. Um, so we, let's go to Ezekiel 14.21. For thus says Yahweh your Elohim, how much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem, sword, famine, wild beast, and plague, to cut off man and beast from it. And again, there's other references that I put prior to this that refers to that, that these are types of, of judgment. We see sword, which means foreign lands coming in to the land to attack Israel and try to destroy it. And we've seen that, we see Babylon, we see Persia, we see the Greeks and the Romans, again, referring to the four different evasions, invasions that Daniel prophesied of with that statue, again, each of these um, coming in to Israel. We see famine as well, uh, wild beasts and plague and pestilence. And if we go over to, uh, again, Revelation 6, 1 to 8, let's go there, because now this speaks, this is in times past that God used, again, the purpose was to bring Israel to repentance. God always warned them as, we, as we're studying the prophets of judgment to come, you know, repent and the judgment won't come. If you don't repent, this is what's going to happen. Same thing is happening now, all through the scriptures. What was the message of John the Baptist or Yohanan the Immerser, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People don't teach repentance anymore. Okay, let's, Revelation, let's go to Revelation 6, verses 1 to 8. You guys are probably there already. Let 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Then I saw the lamb broke one of the seven seals. Now this is referring to the seven seals that can only be opened by Yeshua, the lamb. Broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with the voice of thunder, come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on, on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So you see in verses 1 to 2, now different commentaries say that this is the beginning of the tribulation, could be possibly referring to um, the spirit of the anti-Messiah will actually manifest as a person. I mean, that spirit has been here since Yeshu you know, Yeshua's time. But again, we see, when I see the locust, what came to my mind was this invasion of um, radical Islam all over the world. It's like a locust invasion. I mean, and it is, I mean, we haven't felt the fullness of it, but you look at other countries, they are invading, invading, invading like a locust, little by little. Okay, so um, let's go to verse three to uh, four. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. So here we see civil war and strife, which uh, goes with the, the use of the sword as well in the Tanakh. What do we see? We see, you know, Yeshua says, you're going to see wars and rumors of wars before my return. And, and again, what every, if you look now, every single war that is going on in the world is Islamic. They are, they are invading by the sword. They are beheading people. They are killing Christians. They are killing believers. Also, civil war. We see more civil war and uh, a spirit of strife coming in. Verses 5 and 6. When he broke the third seal, I heard the living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and the not damage the oil and the wine. So here we're seeing this is referring to economic disruption and inflation, which comes from famine. The more lack you have, the more inflation comes. You know, I remember, you know, when there's a lack of oil, what happens? The prices go sky high. When there's a lack of food, what happens? The prices go sky high. We see just this past year, I think the farmers have experienced so much flooding that they're not able, they're not going to be able to reap a crop. What's going to happen? It's going to affect the economic economy and infl inflation. Verses 7 to 8. When the land broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. So here you have all four of these under um, this ashen horse, which is disease and death, but also sword, famine, wild beast, and plague are all being... Um, performed by this, again, this fourth uh, spirit that is let, let loose. Why? Because this is a time of judgment on the earth. Now, as us as believers, we don't have to be fearful of that because we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. We are his children. But we need to warn people. We need to warn people who have ears to hear. What did Yeshua say? He who has ears to hear, listen, of things to come. And we can see it. You know, 40 years from now, when I studied prophecy, 40 years you know, ago when I studied prophecy, some of these things I didn't understand. But you know, the closer we get to Messiah's return, the more evident they are becoming, and the more we're getting understanding of what is happening in these end times. Because a lot of times, you don't understand prophecy until it is starting to be acted out and revealed. Then we see cosmic catastrophe, verses 12 to 15. Look, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, 
and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe fig when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains, and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And, you know, I shared this before, but this vision was so real that, that, the, that the Father gave me as a child. I was probably like maybe 12, 11, 12 years old. You know, because God's hand on me was, you know, since I was young and the enemy has tried to kill me time and time again. But thank God for his preservation. But I, I saw, the, he gave me a vision of the spiritual darkness that was going to be at the end of days. All I can explain is you could feel, it was so dark, you could feel the darkness. You could feel the, the lack of the presence of God because darkness had overtaken the earth. And, you know, I can't explain it, but, I mean, you could feel it. And I sat there, and I remember looking up into the sky, and I saw the heavens split open, and there was Yeshua on the horse, followed by thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And all I thought of was, I'm not ready to stand before him. I felt what the people were going to feel when they finally see him face to face and realize we're not ready to stand before him. And it was, I tell you, that the, when you have a vision from God, you never forget it. It wasn't just a dream that you had that, that you know, woke you up. You know that you know. That was, you know, over 40, 40 50 years ago, and I, have, I, don't, I haven't forgotten it or what I felt when I saw it. By the time Joel wrote these words, it is not prophecy. It is already history. But this history is going to become the background of something prophetic. Again, what, it ha what happened in the past, we are going to see repeating itself in the future. And we're seeing it in the time we are living in. So history, you know, again, what happened is going to happen again. So we see again that, you know, um, where Joel says, well, he, you know, has anything like this ever happened before? And something like this has never happened to Israel. The plague of locusts did happen but it wasn't against Israel, it was against the Egyptians. It was judgment on the Egyptians. Go to uh, Exodus chapter 10. Because, you know, some people say, wait, they, there was, you know, there's been locust evasions before. But this, again, was judgment against the Egyptians, not against Israel, the one that had happened prior I'm not going to read all uh, all of, of 20, but here it's it talks about again the invade the locust invasion. Um, let's begin with uh, verse three. Moshe and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, "Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of the Hebrews: How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me." For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped and what is left to you from the hail. And they will eat every tree, every sprout for you out of the field. Then your horses shall be filled and then your houses shall be filled and the houses of all your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth until this day, and he turned out and went out from Pharaoh. So again, you see, and the judges we are seeing in the last days are not for the believers. They are against, they are against the, the type of world, the type of the Egyptians in the world, okay? The, the world is receiving these judgments, and God has time and time again been warning the world been warning them that, you know, they, they have to repent of their sins. 
Then we look in, uh, again, the plague in, in Joel that was speaking about was due to Israel's sin. Okay, go to Deuteronomy 28.38. You shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather you will gather in little, for the locusts will consume it. So God already again warned them that if they strayed away from Yahweh, that the locusts would come and devour their land, which it did. Again, the prophets are 100% true and accurate. God is 100% true and accurate. Joel one to five. Verse 5 to 6, Awake drunkards and weep, wail all you drinkers of wine on account of sweet wine, for it is denied to your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, vast, yes, without number, its teeth and lion's teeth with jaw teeth of a lioness. Locusts are compared to a nation equivalent to a great army. So let's look at some of these scriptures. Again, God will use a metaphor. Uh, he can literally be referring to locusts and then referring to also a nation or invaders. Let's go to Proverbs 30, 27. The locusts have no king, yet all of them go out in ranks. Again, this is referring to, um, again, the locusts as, you know, creatures, but also can be referring to in the natural. Go to Jeremiah 5, 15 to 17. Behold, I am bringing a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. It is an, an enduring nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open grave, and all of them are mighty men. They will devour your harvest and your food, they will devour your sons and your daughters, they will devour your flocks and your herds, they will devour your vines and your fig trees, they will demolish with sword your fortified cities in which you trust, Yet even in those days, declares the Lord, I will not make a complete destruction. So again, this is an army who is doing the same thing as the locusts would do. What do locusts do? They come and they devour everything in their path. And I'll go to Revelation 9, 3 to 7. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. But note, God's people will have his seal upon them. Hallelujah. Armies are compared to locusts elsewhere in the Tanakh. We see that in um, Judges 6, 5, and 7, 12. Um, let's, go to, let's go look at that. After Joshua and Judges, Judges 6, verse 5. Oh, 6, 5. I'm looking at 5. I'm like, wait, where's that? That doesn't say that. <laughs> For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, and they would come in like locusts for number, 
Both they and their camels are innumerable, and they came into the land to devastate it. So locusts are also always linked with devastation. Go to uh, 712, Judges 712. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Then Isaiah 33, 4. Your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers, as locusts rushing about men rush about on it. And then Jeremiah 46, 23. They have cut, cut down her forest, declared the Lord. Surely it will be no more will no more be found, even though they are now more numerous than locusts and are without number. Then Jeremiah 51, 14. Draw up your battle lines against Babylon on every side. All you who bend the bow, shoot at her and do not be and do not be sparing with your arrows. For she has sinned against Yahweh. Did I get the right scripture there? Oh no, that's not 5114. Duh. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, surely I will fill you with a population like locusts, and they will cry out with shouts of victory over you. And then verse 27, lift up a signal in the land, blow a trumpet among the nations, consecrate the nations against her, summon against her the, the kingdoms of Arat, Nini, and Ashkenaz, appoint a marshal against her, bring up the horses like briskly locusts. Let's go forward. In verse 5, Joel tells the drunkards that the source of the wine has now been removed. So they are not so they are awakened out of their sleep and wheat. Why? Because of the devastation. There was no grapes to make wine. There was no wheat to make to offer sacrifices. It even you know, affected the animals. It affected everything around them. The word used here means to reel in intoxication. They are to awaken out of reeling intoxication, and they are to weep because they have been destroyed by a nation of locusts in verse 6. It is not unusual for locusts to be depicted as a human military army. In fact, both locusts and ants are depicted as a military army in Proverbs 30, 25 to 27. Joel's personal agony is seen in his statement, These locusts have eaten my land. Verse 7, once again, dark describes the totality of this particular devastation. The drunkards who live from one cup of wine to the next, those who have not learned to drink in simple moderation as the Bible allows, but have gone into excess, which the Bible forbids, are the ones lamenting. Indeed, they must, for the source of their joy and security has been eaten by this army of locusts. Joel 1, 13 to 14, gird yourselves and weep, Kohanim, howl, ministers of the altar. Come, lie in sackcloth all night, ministers of my God. For grain and drink offering are withheld from the house of your Elohim. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather elders and all living in the land to the house of Adonai your God and cry to Adonai. One of the reasons that they must mourn this way is given in verse 9. The meal offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of Yahweh. The priests, Yahweh's ministers, mourn, yet mourning uh, pertains to fasting. They must mourn now because there is no offering remaining for the temple. There is no meal offering because the cattle and sheep are dying due to lack of grain. There is no drink offering because the vines have all been eaten up. As a result, the priests who are responsible for making these offerings and who are sustained by these offerings are also to lament. Uh, let's look at Exodus 29, 38 to 42. 
Again, this is pertaining to the offerings. Now, this is what you shall offer on the altar, two one-year-old lambs each day continuously. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And there shall be one-tenth of the ephah, a fine flour, mixed with one-fourth of a hin of beaten oil, and one-fourth of a hin of wine for a drink offering with one lamb. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer it, a same grain offering and the same drink offering as the morning for a soothing aroma and offering by fire to Yahweh. It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of the meeting before Yahweh, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. And then Leviticus 23.13. Its grain offering shall be two uh, tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil, an offering of fire to the Lord for a soothing aroma, with its drink offering a fourth of a hin of wine. So again, these were for the religious festivals, but because of this famine, they had nothing to offer God. They had nothing to bring to him. It was a, their, the, to bring an offering to God was a joy. It was a blessing. You know, and we should we need to have that same attitude when we bring our tithes and our offerings to the Father. We should consider it a joy and a blessing and a privilege. Imagine if you had nothing to give. You know, if you really love God, it breaks it hurts you, it break it'll break your heart. They had nothing to give to God that they were required to give. Joel again describes the totality of the devastation, resulting in a cessation of the joy of harvest in verses 10 to 12. The field is laid waste, the land mourns, for the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil languishes. Be confounded, O you husbandmen, wail, O you vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, for the harvest of the field is perished, the vine is withered, and the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered, for joy is withered away from the sons of men. Again, harvest time was a time of joy. They rejoiced, and the, fir the first fruits of the harvest always went to, the to God. Now they had nothing to rejoice over because there was no harvest. Verse 10, the ground mourns and oil languishes. Joel prophetically, poetically personifies these things as experiencing grief. The presence of grain, wine, and oil is evidence of God's covenant blessing. And we see that in Deuteronomy 7, 13, 11, 14. Uh, in chapter 2, two we'll see uh, that again. And their absence is evidence of God's judgment. Again, go to Deuteronomy 28. So again, they knew this just it wasn't some natural, you know, uh, calamity. They knew that this was judgment from God. Why? Because they had been warned and they knew what the Torah said. Deuteronomy uh, 28, 49 to 51. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand. Again, the curse of a sword coming in the land. A nation of fierce continents who will have no respect for the old, nor sure favor to the young. I mean, I'm sorry, but you see that in radical Islam. They are beheading children who refuse to, to convert to Islam. Moreover, it shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of your ground until you are destroyed, who also leaves you no grain, new wine or oil, nor the increase of your herd or the young of your flock until they have cursed you, to, caused you to perish. And uh, we see this again in Hosea 2.8.9, which we've already done a detailed study on that. So again, 
God forewarned them of what was going to happen if they walked away from the obedience to his Torah. So it wasn't a surprise, and it shouldn't be a surprise to us when we see judgment starting to come on a country or a world that has pretty much thumbed their nose up at God and says, hey, God, I don't care what you have to say. We're going to do it the way we want to do it. Well, guess what? Judgment is going to come, but because of God's mercy, Again, he's continually warning them and warning them and warning them. But again, as believers, we don't have to fear this, but we also have to sound the alarm. And again, it's we're living in a day where they are trying to, you know, shut the mouth of believers and keep them from proclaiming the truth. Verses 15 to 20, the cry, the day of the Lord. Uh, we're going to look at these scriptures, but I want to read the commentary first. A relatively common term in prophetic literature, it points to a day in which the Lord dramatically alters the regular order of things. In many places, it refers to an extraordinary day of judgment for the wicked, and it is often associated with images of darkness and cosmic upheaval. Here the images stress the absence and lack of what is necessary for life. If God is not to pity the sinful people, he should at least pity the blameless animals. This was the Jewish study Bible. But we see that sin affects everybody, even the innocent. This passage introduces Joel's new theme, announcing the coming of the day of Yahweh. In verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of Yahweh is at hand, and as destruction from the Almighty it shall come. Uh, so let's look at some of these scriptures regarding the day of the Lord, Isaiah 13, 6. And it just amazes me. You can see the consistency of God all through scripture. That's why it's important to go to these other verses as well. Isaiah 13, 6. I tell you, as I've been, I've been learning a lot and studying a lot, as I've been digging and going into the background and seeing that what happened in the past to you know to ancient israel because of not obeying god we are seeing repeated in our days as well because even among people that quote call themselves believers we see compromise and we see those that are righteous and we see those that are just acting in name only and doing things contrary to what the word of god says Wail, for the day of Yahweh is near. It will come as destruction from, from the Almighty. Ezekiel 30. And again, if, if you don't know, if you're listening to this DVD and you do not have a relationship with the Father, you do not have a relationship with Yeshua and have been redeemed, you have a lot to fear. But you can that fear, you can be delivered instantly by repenting and coming to Messiah. We don't have to fear. Again, as I see these things happening on the earth, it's just telling me Yeshua is coming soon. And it should urge us to even prayer and intercession even more, especially for our families and our loved ones close to us. But again, God has us marked. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 30, verses 2 and 3. Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says Yahweh your Elohim, Wail, alas for the day, for the day is near, even the day of Yahweh is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword will come upon Egypt, and anguish will be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt, they take away her wealth, and her foundations are torn down. So again, we see judgment is coming to the nations. And it's hard sometimes to study the prophets, but we need to study them. It's not just something, again, that happened in time past. It is happening again today. And when you see day of the Lord, it's referring to the end of days. Uh, Obadiah 15. We're going to actually go in, be going in depth with Obadiah as well. But we'll just look at that, that scripture. Obadiah 15, 
And it's a short book, so it's just before Jonah. For the day of Yahweh draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. So there is judgment coming for the nations. Go to Zephaniah 1, 14 to 15. Zephaniah 1 verses 14 and 15. Near is the great day of Yahweh, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of Yahweh, and all in, the, in it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified city and the high corner towers. And again, you see that brought out in the book of Revelation as well. This passage introduces Joel's new theme announcing the coming of the day of Yahweh. Again, in verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of Yahweh is at hand, and as destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Again, the day of the Lord, um, this is from the ESV, is a major theme in Yoel. It can refer both to the particular devastation of the locust and to a final vindication of God and his people. It can refer to a day of destruction and a threat for Israel or for the nations. However, for God's people is also associated with his presence and blessing and salvation. Verse 15, again, the day of Yahweh, the day when God appears, is a day of judgment. Again, a judgment for those who have come against Israel, a day of judgment for the nations. But for us, it's letting us know, hey, our, our redemption is drawing near because God is dealing. Again, he is a righteous and just God, and he has to deal with sin. Because to, if you, there's only two sides you can be on. You are either on God's side or you are on Satan's side. And Satan has many faces. He will use religion. He will use the occult. He will use anything he can to draw people away. He will use self-righteousness. He will use the lie. Well, I'm a good person. It's like, you know, either you are for God or you are against him. There is no in-between. Joel uh, 1, 18 to 20. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. The flocks of sheep also suffer. To you, Adonai, I cry, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has set ablaze all the trees of the field. Also beasts of the field pant toward you, for the water of Wadis are dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Verse 18, the flocks of sheep suffer. The Hebrew word for suffer is asham. And here it means to suffer punishment or to bear guilt. The idea would be that creation suffers from Israel's guilt. It is also possible to read that this is a form of shamim, to be desolate. So again, our sin just doesn't affect us, but it affects our generations. It affects, you know, again, this, the, the sin of Israel, that, you know, the ancient Israel even affected the animals because the judgment was why, I mean, it had a domino effect. You know, from the wheat to the animals, because the animals depended upon that wheat. You know, an example today, I drink some water, is the honeybee. People think, oh, honeybee, no big deal. Well, you know what? It is a big deal because they affect vegetation. They affect um, agriculture. And if they should demise, it, you know, so it'll affect all of creation, this little bee, this little honeybee that just goes from flower to flower. Again, we don't realize, you know, what God uses, you know, and appreciate what God has done until it's gone. Verse 19 to 20, to you, O Lord, I call. The devastation brought by the Lord can be relieved only by him, 
Fire is sometimes an expression of divine judgment. This is the last uh, verse, so let's go through um, these different scriptures. And we know that the worldwide judgment um, in Noah's time was by water, but the final judgment is going to be by fire. Because God says he will never destroy the earth again by water, but he will by fire. Genesis 19.24. Then the Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord of heaven. And he overthrew these cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. So here we see God's judgment was on this particular these particular cities, because of their sin, was by fire. Go to Numbers 11.1, 1, which is actually the Torah uh, section we just started in. Hallelujah. I, I love Numbers because there's, just, there's so much that is applicable to us as a community in Numbers. Numbers 11.1. 1. Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of Yahweh. And when Yahweh heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of Yahweh burned against them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Again, why? Because they were, they were being ungrateful and unthankful and complaining, thinking that God wasn't going to hear them. But guess what? God hears every word of ours. So again, judgment came, and once again, Moses intercedes. The people therefore cried to Moses, and Moses prayed to Yahweh, and the fire died out. You know, my prayer has been, Father, have mercy on this country. Have mercy on, on you know, on this world for, for the sake of the righteous, for the sake of those that still need to come in. But there's going to come a time that all those who are, who are destined to come into the kingdom have come in, and then judgment's going to come. Whether we go through the tribulation or not, I don't know, because, you know, there's arguments for and against it, you know, pre, mid, or trib. Um, but we know that these judgments are not for God's people. So, um, again, we just have to trust God, and we just need to serve him no matter what and, not, and leave that into his hands. Because you know what? It is in his hands because <laughs> God doesn't give us a time. He does say the dead and Messiah will rise, and those who are alive will come, gather up to meet him, and so we shall ever be with Yahweh. But he doesn't say when. Okay, so we just need to, you know, just when the disciples asked Yeshua, well, when are you going to restore the, you know, the kingdom of Israel? Because they knew the prophet said that the kingdom of Israel would be restored, and they knew it was Messiah who would do it. He goes, don't be concerned about it. This is my paraphrase. You just go and do what God's called you to do. That's in God's hands. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 32.22. I remember one of our conferences, this guy showed up and he was um, selling land to people where they can go hide when things get tough. And I'm like, really? And he was doing this during a service. And I went up to him. I said, you know, this is we're praising, worshiping. I said, this is the time of praise and worshiping, not selling. If you want to sell, go out there. I was just so incensed that he was, again, taking, you've got to watch it. People are going to do, you know, here, buy this land. This is going to be a city of refuge where you can go and hide. It's like, really? I wonder how much money he made off of uh, people that didn't, <laughs> that didn't weren't discerning. 32.22. For a fire is kindled in my anger and burns to the lowest part of Sheol, and consumes the earth with its yield and sets on fire the foundations of of the mountain. So let's go back, let's go back a little bit more and, and see why he said this. Verse 21. They have made me jealous with what is not Elohim. They have provoked me to anger with their idols, so I will make them jealous and those who are not a people, and I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. Again, for a fire is kindled in my anger and burns in the lowest parts of Sheol and consumes the earth with its yield and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. 
and I will keep, keep misfortunes on them, and I will use my arrows on them. They will be wasted by famine and consumed by plague and bitter destruction, and the teeth of beasts I will send upon them with the venom of crawling things of the dust. Outside the sword will bereave and inside tear. Again, we see those same things, sword, famine, pestilence, you know, being used as judgments. Jeremiah 4.4. 4. Or Jeremiah, Jeremiah, who? Jeremiah. And again, the more you are aware of the prophetic word, the more you are going to be aware of the times that we are living in. And you're not going to be one who is, a, a, who is one who is drunk or asleep and not realizing what has happened. Because you'll know what the prophets are saying and you'll be able to read the signs of the times. Jeremiah 4.4 4. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. Men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Go to uh, Hosea 8.14 which we just were through doing it. We did our whole study in Hosea or Hosea 8.14. For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. But I will send a fire on its cities that it may consume its palatial dwellings. And then Amos, which we're going to be getting to next after Joel, Verses, uh, actually several verses, chapter 1, verse 4. So I will send fire upon the house of Haziel, and it will consume the citadels of Ben-Hadad. Go to verse 7. So I will send fire upon the wall of Gaza. Verse 10. So I will send fire upon the wall of Tyre, and will consume her citadels. Verse 14. So I will kindle a fire on the wall of Rabah, and will consume her citadels amid war cries on the day of battle and a storm on the day of tempests. And then go to Zephaniah 118. These little books, sometimes it's harder to find them because they're, they're just like maybe a, a page or something. Oh, there we go, Zephaniah, hallelujah. 118. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. Verse uh, chapter 3, verse 8 in Zephaniah. Therefore, wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. And then, last, Revelation 21 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I know somebody from our congregation was sharing that this pastor was on TV saying that, oh, there is no hell, that, you know, everybody in hell is going to be eventually let out. Oh, really? What did I just read? That's not what the scripture says. You have to be careful of people that speak contrary to the word. I mean, Yeshua mentioned it. The prophets mention it. Here in Revelation, it mentions exactly who is destined for it. We need to be aware, again, of the truth of his word and be students, Talmudim, of his word. And that's the purpose of us going through, again, these prophets, book by book, verse by verse. 
So again, because they are not just speaking in the past, they are also speaking of the present, and they are also pointing out the future that's to come. Amen. Hallelujah. Alvina Mokano, our Father, our King, Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your holy word, Father. We thank you that we take heed to the voice of the prophets. Father, that every day, Father, that we look for the return of our Messiah, Yeshua, and sound the alarm and warn people that they need to come to repentance in order to escape the judgment that is coming. Father, make us bold as lions and, and as serpents and harmless as doves, Father. Father, Father, help us to uh, put, that you would put the words in our mouth and that we would speak what we need to speak, Father, when we have the opportunity to share your word. We thank you for your word. Father, help us to be uh, Bereans, Father, who dig, who just don't list, take what somebody says, but they go back and we go back and we search the word to find out if these things are true because there are many charlatans and liars out there uh, pretending to proclaim the truth and they're proclaiming lies. We need to be students of your word, Father, so that we will not be deceived and we will not be fooled in the days that we are living in, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Hallelujah.